Sushi is becoming so popular these days, you can find it in grocery stores all over America, but it's distinctly Japanese. And the Japanese have turned sushi into a multi-billion dollar international business. Sushi wouldn't be sushi without tuna, particularly bluefin tuna. It is so revered in Japan that they call it the king of sushi. But as we reported last January, the bluefin is in deep trouble. Fresh bluefin tuna arrives in style at Tokyo's Narita Airport every day from all over the world. They're carefully packed in crates and unloaded onto pallets, often less than 24 hours after being caught. It's delivered on ice in custom-made wooden boxes called coffins, delivered to the Tokyo fish market, which is called Skiji, and which is the place where the world's top sushi chefs get their fish. More fish flow through Skiji than any other market on Earth. More money, too. Four billion dollars a year. In today's global economy, fishermen from around the world watch the prices set here at Skiji, which enables them to figure out what their catch is worth. Harvard anthropology professor Ted Bester understands the movement of money in tuna. He's been studying Japanese sushi culture for the last 20 years. This place is, is the nerve center of a global fishing industry. It's sort of like a Wall Street of fish. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. There's no futures market, no derivatives, but other than that, it's, uh, it's like the Wall Street of fish. Why haven't All bluefin tuna, uh, all fresh and all expensive. At 4 o'clock every morning, six days a week, the buyers arrive at the market's fresh tuna hall to check out what's on offer. How do the buyers know what's good and what's not so good? Well, if you look over, you can see them rolling the, the tuna over on their side, looking in the belly, they're looking for the fat content, they're looking for the color of the meat. They're essentially, they're x-raying the fish. And then you'll see that they'll, they'll take a little piece and they'll rub it between their thumb and forefingers and that's to get a sense of the uh, oil content. So these guys must be the toughest customers in the world. Absolutely, they, they know the fish inside and out. They literally know the fish inside out. They know this market inside out, and they're prepared to pay the highest price in the world. The price of a single bluefin tuna is anywhere between $2,000 and $20,000. It all depends on the size, the season, and the fat content. The fattier, the better. Suninori Ida is one of the most respected buyers in the market. His family has been bidding on top quality bluefin here for seven generations. He's well versed in the auctioneer's lingo. He knows the signals. Within seconds, he's bid for and bought the most expensive tuna at today's auction, a 450 pounder for $8,500. Ida is the master of the House of Hicho, a wholesaler supplying Tokyo's most exclusive sushi restaurant. He wields his blades like a latter day samurai. Is the, the maestro at work. Like everything in Japan, it's a ceremony. The fresh bluefin is massaged and stroked as befitting a king. The masters even have what they call Maguru no Kaiwa, conversations with the tuna. Ida appeals to the fish to make him proud and give him their best. Oh, you all. The demand for the freshest bluefin tuna from the world's most exclusive restaurants is insatiable. So how is this global yen for bluefin satisfied? Well, globally, from the coast of Japan, the Gulf of Maine, Mexico, or the Mediterranean. It's here in the Mediterranean that the tuna come every springtime to spawn, and it's here that fishermen have been lying in wait for them for millennia. The bluefin tuna has provided protein to all the great civilizations which sprung up on these shores. We're in Sardinia right now, an island off the coast of Italy, and the fishermen here go after the bluefin much the same way their ancestors did during the days of the Roman Empire. Fishermen from the village of Carlo Forte fix nets to the ocean floor, trapping the migrating bluefin in giant chambers. We went out with divers to check on their trap. 
We had no idea what to expect. Floating walls of net stretching six stories high. There's no escape here for these juggernauts who can cross the Atlantic at 70 miles an hour. The only sound, the bubbles from the oxygen tanks. Then, a truly exceptional sight. Seeing tuna on a sushi plate is one thing. Seeing the king of sushi down here is something else entirely. Within a few hours, the tuna and the fishermen will be face to face, locked in an ancient ritual called the matanza, which means literally, the slaughter. The Matanza begins with a small armada. Old boats with rusty hulls are towed out and hauled into position surrounding the nets. Over the course of the next two hours, the fishermen close in on their prey, bringing their boats and their nets closer and closer to each other. It's a life and death struggle for the giant bluefin. The smaller fish are wrestled on board. The larger ones have to be winched. The churning waters and the decks of the boats run red. In the end, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. And think of it, this bloody battle is all in the service of sushi. This may seem like an enormous catch and it's terribly impressive, but the fishermen insist that they're catching fewer fish and smaller fish than in previous years. And the situation is so bad, they say, that they don't know how long they'll be able to stay in business. To stay afloat, this ancient ritual has been put in the service of a very modern corporate culture. All the tuna is taken to a factory ship moored a short distance away. Japanese buyers of Mitsubishi, yes, that Mitsubishi, are on board too. They pay big bucks for big bluefin, and they'd like to buy the whole catch, 600 in all. The fish are weighed and measured, and most are simply not big enough. Only 54 will make the trip to Tokyo. The rest will be sold by Giuliano Greco, who manages the Matanza, and who'll send the remainder onto canneries, restaurants, and sushi bars across Europe. Greco's family, have been the owners of this Carlo Forte tuna factory for more than 350 years. He and the others who run the few remaining Matanzas agree that their problems stem from a drastic change in the way most tuna are now caught. In the 1990s, a new vessel started fishing for tuna in the Mediterranean. It was called a purse saner, and it brought on a revolution in tuna fishing. Each of these vessels can encircle and trap some 3,000 bluefin. That's in one go, one toss of the net. Before long, there were more than 300 persainers working here, and the new method of fishing proved so efficient that it made the Matanza look like some old relic left over from the Middle Ages. It's high-tech fishing on an industrial scale. The persainers prowl the Mediterranean spawning grounds waiting for word from spotter planes that are patrolling overhead. When schools of bluefin come to the surface, the planes relay the coordinates to the persainers, who then rush to encircle them. It's something that Roberto Mielgo has seen firsthand. He was around when persainers first started fishing for tuna in the Mediterranean. How many of these vessels are there in the Mediterranean right now? Maybe 39 French, 60 Tunisians, I would say 60 Croatians, 120 Turks, 92 Italian. You're dealing with an enormous business. This is, this is huge business, yes. It's, uh, the stakes are very high. Mielgo has seen as many as 300 tons of bluefin tuna, worth as much as $2 million, trapped inside one of these nets. Divers open a gap and count them, as they're transferred into pens the size of a football field. Tugboats then slowly drag the pens with a live tuna inside to tuna ranches. Tuna ranches? To me, the word ranching refers to cattle. Yes, but you do not breed uh, the, the bluefin tuna at the ranch. You actually fatten the fish to gain up to 20% weight. 
They feed them sardines and mackerel. They control the color, the flavor. In three to six months, the tuna will be big enough and fat enough to harvest. Ninety percent of them will go to Japan, which imports as much tuna as it can. Any tuna, half a million tons a year. Most of it is blast frozen on board these ships, which arrive in Japanese ports every day. They're stored in giant freezer rooms at a bone chilling minus seventy five degrees Fahrenheit. At any given time, there are over sixty thousand tons of frozen tuna stockpiled in what some call Japan's strategic reserve. That's sixty thousand tons of fish, and one frozen correspondent. Freezing tuna at such low temperatures has transformed what was once a fresh delicacy into a commodity, with virtually no expiration date. The king of sushi is no longer treated like royalty. It is scraped and planed, and then cut up into blocks. This tuna will make its way to supermarkets and thousands of low-end sushi restaurants, where you can eat a piece of bluefin for as little as 50 cents. The industry's ability to supply the global market with inexpensive sushi has stoked demand, and that's created a Mediterranean gold rush. So, what game is being played here? It's、uh, the Wild West. These days, Roberto Mielgo spends his time tracking fishing boats and monitoring catches, and he's found that the international quotas which limit tuna fishing are not being enforced. And those spotter planes. They're officially banned, but are still hunting tuna. Illegal fishing is rampant. And if this trend continues, all I can say is that if we carry on like this, we are bound to catastrophe. I mean, it's as simple as that. No more fish, no more industry, no more culture. And no more matanza. This may well be the last year. That the weary fishermen of Carlo Forte raise their flag, telling their village that they've had a catch. The future of fishing in the Mediterranean is no longer in their hands. It's in the hands of large fishing fleets, who are in a race to catch the last tuna. Back in Tokyo's Skiji Market, the most expensive tuna sold this year went to a buyer from Hong Kong, reflecting China's growing appetite for sushi. The price, fifty-five. Thousand dollars.